What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and welcome to another Pokemon Sword and Shield VGC 2021 video. Now today's video is a, a controversial one to say the least. Uh, and I feel like those of you who played the season competitively, who have entered a few tournaments, who qualified for Players Cup 2, etc. Won't disagree with me on this, but uh, some of the newer players may disagree with me on this. Uh, and that is the fact that VGC Series 7 is probably the most diverse and balanced meta we've had in all of Sword and Shield. And I'll be explaining why in this video and debunking the three comments I get the most. And those are that there's no diversity, that you have to use Legends to succeed, and that this is not a balanced metagame. Now, before we get into that, I want you to do me a favor, comment down below your initial impression on the season and your current impression of the season, and maybe go back and edit it after the video and let me know what you think about the points I brought up. And yeah, uh, if you enjoy this video at any point in time, do me a favor, leave a like on it, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications because I'll be bringing you guys some daily VGC content. Let's go ahead and get into it. This might be a little bit unorganized, but that's because I'm doing this a bit off the cuff. I do have some notes and I do have all my resources pulled up, but let's go ahead and get into it. I'll be going in order in the comments I listed. Uh, I'll debunk that there's no diversity. I will debunk that there are, that you have to use Legends to succeed, and I'll debunk that this uh, metagame isn't balanced. So let's start off with this being a meta with no diversity. So I'll start off and I'll qualify this by saying I think the only issue when it comes to diversity is the fact that Tapu Fini is the best water type and it's very hard to find competition for it in this format. However, um, that's only one Pokemon and beyond that I really don't see many issues when it comes to diversity. This is the first tournament we had this season, the VR Challenge, the Victory Road Challenge. and. This is probably going to be the most homogenous group of Pokemon you will see for the rest of the video. And the reason that is, is because it was the beginning of the season, people used what they knew would work, and there wasn't much testing done prior. Now that it's been a couple of weeks since then, and we have the results from Players Cup 2 in every single region, I, I can pretty much debunk that there is no diversity in the format. So let's start off with the number one team, Joseph Ugarte. He was running Kartana, Rotom Heat, which by the way, Rotom Heat was a great metagame call by him, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, Gastrodon, Landorus, Dragapult, and Tyranitar. <clears throat> now, this team is way different than what you'll see below. Yes, there is a Landorus, but guess what? There are like six more Landorus in this entire thing, uh, out of 26 people. Yes, there is a Kartana. Kartana is a very common Pokemon. However, beyond that, the team was an excellent metagame call. Rotom Heat was great for beating Tapu Fini, as well as opposing Kartana and Amoongus. Uh, the Gastrodon was great for supporting this Rotom Heat when it came to the Tapu Fini matchup, because while Rotom Heat is good for beating Tapu Fini, it doesn't want to take a max water move, so Gastrodon is able to switch in and make that thing essentially immune, as well as getting a special attack boost. Landorus Therian, an excellent Pokemon overall, not nearly as dominating as it was in previous formats, where it was the number one most used. This, it's sort of balancing between second and third most used. Uh, it's great for intimidating, it's an excellent ground type, uh, can you turn in and out, it's a good Dynamax option when it comes to Life Orb Max Airstream, etc. Dragapult, great Pokemon, can't be intimidated, excellent Dynamax option, great Ghost type, great Dragon type, nothing really uh, to talk about beyond that there. It's also good for beating Metagross, which is really common in the format right now. And finally Tyranitar, an interesting option to say the least, uh, his weakness policy user I believe, uh, it was able to help out versus the Lapras matchup, versus the uh, genies, whether if they were physical genies like this one, it didn't want to take a superpower, but obviously uh, it could catch them in other situations and beat them. <clears throat> so yeah, that was the number one team. Notice how it is much different than what you will see below. Pretty different. That was the first tournament. This is where you'll see the most homogeneity. If we go through the rest of the teams, you'll see that we have good stuffs. And let me explain what good stuffs is. Good stuffs is what will people call, people will call it the standard team. It is a team made of Pokemon that are reliable in the format, that are relatively bulky, that synergize very well, and are very splashable. Essentially a team of splashable Pokemon. Pokemon that can fit on most teams, however when you put them together they, they still work, you know? Uh, and that isn't the most dominating team in the metagame, which is something that people might believe and I'll get in I'll get into that more when it comes to the balance part of things. However, this is the most common team. If you're going to make an argument for no diversity, this is what you will point to. But why would you only point to that when you see all of these other team comps? So if we look at this. Rillaboom, Heatran, Tapu Fini, Landorus, 
uh, Moltres and Togedomaru. Way different than what we see up there. Yes, there is a Tapu Fini. Yes, there is a Landorus. But what else do they have in common? Relatively nothing. This team, Screens plus Tricroon Glacier, another team that you will see pretty often in the format. Where is it up here? Do you see anything in common? No. Those are th That is pretty straightforward evidence that Look, look at these. These teams are essentially different beyond the fact that they usually have a Tapu Fini and some of them have um, a Moongus next to Tapu Fini. Like, you'll see a couple similar teams. Once again, a Good Stuffs team. Down here, we'll find another Good Stuffs team. But it has a Mamoswine, and it has a Raichu. There's, there's way... <laughs> there, there are way too many differences between these teams to call it completely homogenous. These are completely different teams, whether it comes to EV spreads... I, the uh, moves they're running, the items they're running, they're entirely different, and they play entirely different too. Let's look at number 26th and number 25th. We'll compare these two. Number 26th, I've used this team personally. Blacephalon, excellent metagame call. Next to Colossal, it has an unfake outable, unredirectable fire type move that will hit the Colossal as well as the opponents, dealing massive damage and activating Steam Engine, allowing GMAX Colossal to use its max move to great effect. Uh, Mesprit, great for stopping Trick Room, very bulky, has access to Ice Beam to help beat opposing landers. Defiant Thunderous, more common in the format than the rest of the team, however it's great versus uh, Intimidate Pokemon like Incineroar, uh, in Landorus it's able to max Airstream and be a great Dynamax option, as well as deter Intimidate overall from things like Rillaboom and Water Urshifu. Water Urshifu, Aqua Jet into the Colossal, times 4 effective, but not too strong in the grand scheme of things once you Dynamax, allows it to get Steam Engine as well as Weakness Policy, activating it. And Rillaboom, great for synergizing with the Colossal, get, uh, grants it passive recovery, while Rillaboom also helps deal with water types, uh, able to one-shot them under Grassy Terrain, Fake Out is great, and it also uh, sets the Grassy Terrain to cut the damage from Earthquake from opposing landers. This is a well-built team. Whoever made this team had excellent team-building fundamentals, which is another thing I need to talk about later in the video. This team, sort of a good stuffs team. It is good stuffs with Zapdos over Regieleki, pretty much. Regieleki is more of a screens user, Zapdos is more of a bulky Misty Seed user. I believe it gets Tailwind this generation. I might be wrong. I forgot, because I don't see too much of it. We see Urshifu. Or actually, let me, let me just pull up the export. Let me just pull up the export. Weakness Policy Metagross, Leftovers Tapu Fini, Assault Vest Landers Therian, Eviolite, Clefairy, uh, Life Orb, Zapdos, and Urshifu. This team plays entirely different from the previous team. Entirely different. What is While well, this team wants to activate the um, the weakness policy on the Colossal and sweep with it, as well as stop Trick Room with Imprison, uh, Mesperit, and other things, this team wants to just play the long game. It might want to activate weakness policy on their Metagross with an Earthquake from the Landris. However, it's a very bulky team. It's able to synergize extremely well, and it's a team of splashable Pokemon that you can fit on most teams. Once again, not dominating. In fact, quite the opposite. You see more more diverse teams than anything, really. We also see uh, a new team composition in Comfey plus... Where is it? I'm pretty sure there was a Comfey plus uh, Galarian Moltres team somewhere, but I guess we'll just get into Screens Galarian Moltres. Screens Galarian Moltres, another new team composition that this metagame brought us. And essentially what you do is you use Light Screen and Reflect on Regieleki, set it up extremely fast, making it so Moltres can get its weakness policy as well as a nasty plot off in the same turn, sometimes even going down to Berserk range, giving it plus 5 and allowing it to sweep from there. Galarian Moltres has a bad matchup versus a lot of things in the format. You'll see, Some people will say like, all I see is Galarian Moltres screens. Well guess what? If you're always losing to it, that means you have a bad team composition because you don't, you're not prepared for it. Team building fundamentals include knowing what's in the metagame and being able to beat it with something on your team, having a backup plan, having a plan to beat pretty much everything or at least play out of a very tough situation. So when it comes to diversity, we're like halfway debunked. There's a lot of Tapu Fin here, but guess what? First tournament of the season, things get different when people have time to experiment. Players Cup 2. Winner's bracket for North America. That's the results I have here. Look at these teams. The only through line you can truly draw is Tapu Fini. Once again, the only issue in the format I have is Tapu Fini is pretty much the best water type. This team, Kyle Living House, excellent team, great team building fundamentals, screens, weakness policy, Glacier, uh, Urshifu, Incineroar, sort of a standardish team, but a different take on a standard team. Incineroar and Tapu Fini is considered good stuff, especially if you're pairing it next to an Aleki and a Dusclops, but Urshifu and Glacier on that 
a very different team than what we see uh, from Kokoro, who is running uh, a Clefairy plus Kartana with Urshifu, Defiant Thunderous, Nihiligo, another interesting Pokemon we'll get into later, and Rotom Heat. Nick Navarre running a hybrid Sun team, Trick Room, Screens, Sun Offense, GMAX Venusaur, and Landorus. This team, a Good Stuffs team with Screens. How many Good Stuffs teams have we seen? Essentially two, and Kyle's hardly counts. Next up we have Alex Underhill, went 5-0 with Regigigas and Weezing. Something that I have to eat my words about, because I said Regigigas Weezing would be bad. I was wrong. At high level play, you can expect to do well with it, especially if you're a great player. If you're not a very good player and you expect to get carried by it, don't do not do that. Uh, but someone as talented as Lexicon, he's going to he's gonna go far with it. So yeah. Wolf Glick running Screens Moltres with a Trick Room option in Glacier. Weakness policy, weakness policy Moltres with Screens once more. And finally, Nick Safranek, good friend of mine. Uh, he's He goes to the Chicago locals. This guy's running a completely different team from everyone else. He's running Draining Kiss, Weakness Policy, Moltres. He has a Rotom Heat on the team. However, Rillaboom and Mamoswine. Mamoswine's an excellent metagame call for beating opposing Landorus. As we see, there's... Well, actually, no. In top 8, in top 16, there was like one Landorus. So that, that was interesting. Uh, but I'm sure he faced a lot of Landorus on the way there. Because uh, I definitely did. However, it's not intimidatable. It's able to beat things like opposing Sack Attack, which want to set up Trick Room. It has a great matchup versus uh, Galarian Moltres because it hits it on the physical side of things, which are, it's, it's a little bit more soft on that side. So that team functions entirely different. These are all completely different teams. We see even more examples of this when we have someone running Spectrier, we have someone running Rain in Series 7, we see a Garchomp in Top 8. Once again, Garchomp, alternative to Landorus, that will be excellent uh, later on in the video when I'm explaining that you don't have to run Legendaries. And we also see Sun Hybrid Trick Room. EU, more of the same when it comes to uh, NA. We see a lot of screens plus Glacier. We see Snorlax in top eight with Indeedee Mail. Keep in mind that, that's kind of crazy. Uh, Landorus Incarnate, Dracovish, Sand Offense, more, uh, more Rillaboom, Dragapult, and Colossal Shenanigans, and then a couple of Good Stuff's teams. And then we have, it's essentially like the same story all the way through, especially this team, Red Ash. Great player, I think I played him in Mount Silver a couple of times. This guy, one Legendary on his team. Stack Attacka. Guess what? You could exchange that for a couple of other things. He could use a Metagross there if you wanted to, or if you wanted to keep the Trick Room aspect, he could use something like a uh, Dusclops there instead. But he would lose the Steel type, so probably Metagross, especially since he likely has Trick Room on the Mimikyu. As you can see, there's a lot of diversity in this team, or er, in, in these team lists. I don't really understand why anyone who is experienced in this game and has played in tournaments would make the claim that there's no diversity whatsoever, because this game, this series, this format, Tons of diversity. Now, some people will look at legends and say, well, legendaries mean that there's no diversity because you have to use legendaries. Dead wrong. Dead wrong. What do we see here? We see two legendaries. Entei hardly counts as one. Celesteela, honestly, not seeing high usage anyways. You could replace that with a different steel type. Metagross would work just as well. Entei could be replaced with like an Arcanine or an Incineroar. We see here, how many legends? One legend, Stack Attacka. Once again, could be replaced with a different Trick Room Setter, different steel type. There's a lot of teams that you could just replace a legend with something else. Why did they use a legend? Because they wanted to use the legend. Because the legend seemed to do the job better than what they had used in other, like in other teams when it came to testing. But can you make a team with no legends? Yes. While I haven't like filled out the EV spreads here, would you want to face this team? Would you want to face this team in bracket? Because it's got Bulldoze, Salamis, Weakness Policy, Metagross, Redirection, plus Trick Room, as well as Hybrid uh, Sun Trick Room with Venusaur. That's a scary team to face. How many Legends? Zero. Now, when I'm team building, do I use Legends? Yes, I, I do use Legends. And why do I use them? Because they feel reliable to me. I don't want to have to explore too far. If you have good team building fundamentals, you can explore pretty far and use things that you can, like, that you want to use. For example, I made a video a couple of days ago where we randomized a Pokemon, me and 9th Gym, and we got stuck with Wide Lens Meowth. We used Wide Lens Meowth in one, like, was it, four out of the five matches we had in that video. Yesterday's video, I wanted to use Altaria with Misty Seed as a Parish Song win condition. I won with Parish Song and Altaria. Altaria worked, it was walling things like Metagross. If you know what you're team building for, if you know how to EV train these things, if you know what like you want to live, what it needs to do, what it needs, what it needs to outspeed to succeed in the format, you can get away with it. That's just how it's been. Uh, so I, I guess that's almost it for uh, 
debunking the need in legendaries to succeed. Um, one thing I will say is that there are some people who will try to use like an Eviolite Metapod then cry about the game being unbalanced when they can't win with that. Just, I feel like I don't need to say this, but Pokemon was never meant to be a game where Metapod can beat a Moltres or Metapod can beat a Mewtwo. That's just not how it works. However, if you have good fundamentals, you could get away with it. If you really, really like hammered away at it, chipped away at that team, figured out how to use it, there, there are ways to get a, to get around that, but it, it wouldn't be ideal. At high level play, people will use more standard teams because they feel that that is what they need to use to succeed. However, there are a lot of players in the past who have branched out, who have succeeded with very crazy teams. Keep in mind, we have people like Ashton Cox, Jeremy Rodriguez, who team build together and will bring these things to tournaments. Um, but like overall, more you will see more standard than you'll see people branching out. However, when you branch out, you do get rewarded with it. Uh, you do get rewarded with uh, good results if you know what you're doing. So yeah, uh, next up, I want to debunk that this game is not balanced. Saying that the game is not balanced is sort of an early call to make as far as it as far as uh, the series goes, because a balanced game, uh, I guess a good example would be uh, a balanced game is a game where you can use multiple different builds of something and consistently do well, given you have the right skill level. An unbalanced game is where someone with a high skill level, like an extremely high skill level, best of the best, cannot get away with using something that isn't the best character in the game. So imagine if you wanted to play Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, but the best character in the game was like Dark Pit. Imagine you spent hours and hours grinding away using Samus. Now you could be the best Samus player in the world, but you would never beat an average Dark Pit player. That is an unbalanced game. Pokemon is not at all like that. Yes, you could have a Metapod and never beat a Metagross, uh, but that's not how teams work. Teams are six Pokemon that function well together, that do well together, that have a plan, that synergize and like function as sort of a machine. If you can build one of these machines well enough where it has a game plan versus all other machines, all other team builds, like you don't have to like counter everything, but you have to have a plan for it. You have to account for it. That's what team building fundamentals are. You have to be able to do that. If you know what you're doing, you can succeed with just about everything in this format. Just about. Once again, not a Metapod, but my Altaria situation seems like a good example. And I put up this tweet the other day because I was frustrated. Like I got, I literally have people in my comments saying that there's no diversity. Screens Moltres, Regigigas Weezing, Glacier Trick Room, Cole Blacephalon, Metagross Tornadus, uh, Finny Cart and Cineroar. It, it's more than we had in Series 6. And some people were also like saying like, yeah, we had other things. I think uh, Nora mentioned that like, sun hybrid stuff was common as well if we look at it like the the usage stats don't really show you much yes finny is nearly at 50 percent usage yes landers is nearly at 40 yes incinera is nearly at 30 but that's because they're splashable pokemon finny isn't always going to be run next to landers incinera metagross reggie lucky glacier corselia finny could be on a team with kartana thunderous uh whimsicott Togekiss, Marowak, Alola, Ferrothor, and Garchomp. Like, it, it could be on any one of those teams because it's so easy to put onto it. You can focus more on building around the Garchomp you really want to use if you take some of the burden off of it by running a Tapu Fini next to it, which, you know, sometimes you might want to do that. If we look at Series 6, which is something that people will claim is, like, peak VGC, and I, I feel like that's a very ignorant claim, um, Series 6 had Amoongus at nearly 40% usage, and that was strictly because it was so, so hyper offensive. The main builds you would see in Series 6 were like Talonflame plus Lapras, Talonflame plus Dracozolt, Talonflame plus um, Durant. It was, it was all like hyper offensive stuff. There was very little, there, there wasn't like a slow way to play the game. You were either playing hyper offense or you were losing pretty much. Like there, there wasn't much slowness to the game. There wasn't much nuance. It was sort of like rocket tag, which is why I, I didn't enjoy that series. Did I do well on the ladder? I, I think I did pretty well. I was able to hit top 500 a couple of times, but I didn't enjoy it because I was using things that I didn't like. This series, I can get away with using a lot. So I, I guess that's really it to the video. Um, like I said, it might have been just a little bit 
unorganized. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below of what I brought to you today. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you enjoy Pokemon content because I bring it to you daily. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Turn on notifications. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.